Thank you all for being with us today. As you may be aware, the Clean Cooking Alliance is hosting the first ever week of clean cooking, which includes a series of virtual engagements, events, content releases, and networking opportunities to catalyze action and engage everyone across the clean cooking ecosystem. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Please keep yourselves muted, and this event will be recorded and posted on YouTube after the event. This morning, we'll, we are hosting our flagship plenary event, which features three sessions, including a presentation and discussion on the evolution and next steps of the clean cooking system strategy, and a high level panel conversation with women leading on the clean cooking agenda. But first, I will hand it over to CCA's Chief of Staff and External Affairs, Jeline Connors Belopolsky, for the launch of a new multi stakeholder energy compact on clean cooking. Thank you, Donnie. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning to commence our week of clean cooking plenary session. Providing clean energy to households is critical to achieving global climate and sustainable development goals. Yet, with fewer than 10 years until we reach 2030, the world remains far off track to meet SDG 7. Approximately one third of the world's population today, 2.6 billion people still lack access to clean cooking solutions, costing trillions of dollars in damage to the climate and local economies, and contributing up to 4 million premature deaths each year. To date, the level of funding and investment in the clean cooking sector has not matched the global magnitude of the challenge, and we are running out of time. The recent high-level dialogue on energy offered an unprecedented opportunity to accelerate progress on SDG 7 on a trajectory in line with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. As an outcome of the dialogue, energy compacts aim to mobilize commitments from governments, business, international, and civil society organizations, sending out actions planned to advance clean, affordable energy for all by 2030, and net zero emissions by 2050. So far, 130 energy compacts have been submitted, reflecting nearly $500 billion in government and private sector finance and investment commitments, and over $215 billion in catalytic partnerships. But the focus of these initial compacts has been unevenly distributed across SDG 7 targets. And in fact, only 17 compacts include any form of commitment or action on clean cooking, accounting for a mere fraction of financing and investment pledges. We commend those governments who have registered bold and ambitious, the donors and international organizations who've stepped up their support and the enterprises and civil society dedicated to implementation. However, the commitments alone are not to achieve so today, the Clean Cooking Alliance is launching a multi which aims to serve as a catalyst and umbrella to gather more confidence from the full range of actors who will need to work together in harmony. This compact incorporates the recommendations of the Dialogue Technical Working Group on Energy Access, the Clean Cooking Principles adopted at the ministerial forums, and is grounded in the findings and collaborative process of CCA's Clean Cooking System Strategy, which you'll hear more about later this morning. At the heart of the Unlock the SDGs and Net Zero with Clean Cooking Compact is the ambition to achieve universal access by 2030, with critical milestones to reach 750 million people by 2025, 1.5 billion people by 2027. To achieve universal access, national governments must be empowered and supported to determine the transition path that best suits their local context. And the clean sector must optimize and align to these national plans, rapidly scaling all viable solutions, including the use of energy. This is supported by seven transformative goals, which must be pursued urgently and simultaneously. Clean cooking must be integrated into national and city energy planning, embedded within nationally determined contributions and implemented through coordinated delivery mechanisms with the man resources to lead progress. 
high-access deficit countries must create supportive and stable environments and mobilize public funding to enable rapid adoption of clean cooking solutions. Policy and regulatory reforms, such as targeted tax policies that level the playing field against non-clean forms of cooking and provide greater access to the as well as national standards and labeling, will promote increased uptake of affordable, energy efficient, and clean cooking technologies. We need to dramatically scale public and private investment for clean cooking, supporting the mobilization of at least $5 billion per year into the sector by 2025, $10 billion per year by 2027, and upwards of $20 billion per year by 2030. The sector needs a steady supply of patient, risk tolerant, innovative mechanisms such as concessional and blended finance, and reduced barriers to results-based financing to address the needs of enterprises and the affordability gap for consumers. And we must put people at the center of clean cooking solutions, ensuring that policies, programs, product design, and business models reflect the variety of human needs and user preferences. The people-centered cooking approach includes a social safety net, the modern to those who cannot afford the full cost. And rather than compete for scarce resources, we must build synergies with electrification efforts. Clean cooking energy demand must be integrated into national energy planning and strategies, and both sectors should increase collaboration to identify shared opportunities for innovation and partnership. And we must rapidly scale opportunities for women to participate in the sector as providers and decision makers, instead of users, aiming for equal representation in the sector by 2050 and incentivizing the inclusion of objectives in clean cooking policies, programs, and business models. And we must do all of this with a focus on leaving no one behind. Further progress on climate and development goals cannot be achieved without significantly increasing access to electricity and clean among the poorest and most vulnerable populations, including displacement-affected communities. Creative, context-sensitive solutions and focused funding are needed to unleash truly inclusive, sustainable energy access. Changing the way families cook their food each day is critical to achieving development and climate goals. Quite simply, there can be no just energy transition without universal access to clean cooking. Achieving the goals of this compact will not only improve energy access, equity, and quality of life for more than 2.6 billion people, including those living in poverty and areas of humanitarian crisis, it will avoid one gigaton of CO2 emissions and reduce black carbon, prevent millions of premature deaths from air pollution each year, empower millions of women and girls, drive sustained enterprise growth and create hundreds of thousands of green jobs, and boost resilience for many of those most vulnerable to climate change through environmental protection and restoration, better health and safety, and improved livelihoods. Making these solutions work will require a coordinated approach across the entire clean cooking sector with a role for every actor. We invite industry, city, or organization to endorse this energy compact and register your specific commitments to help us unlock the SDGs and net zero with clean cooking. But first, we'll hear from some countries, donors, and organizations about why they support this effort and how they are working to turn these ambitions into reality. So I'll hand back to Donnie. Thank you. Thanks, Jalene. As you so clearly articulated, even with 130 compacts that have been registered thus far, and even if those commitments are attained, we will not reach clean cooking for all by 2030, which is exactly why the Clean Cooking Alliance is launching a multi-stakeholder energy compact on clean cooking. A critical element to ensure the actualization of this multi-stakeholder compact is the commitment from leading country governments. Today, we'll be hearing short interventions from representatives from the governments of Sierra Leone, Kenya, and Bangladesh on why they are endorsing this compact, as well as some of the details on what they are doing to advance clean cooking in their countries. 
Our first country government speaker is Dr. Eldred Tunde Taylor. Dr. Taylor is the deputy minister from the Ministry of Energy in Sierra Leone. Dr. Taylor, can you briefly provide us with some details about the steps Sierra Leone is taking to advance clean cooking in your country? Yes, thank you very much, Madam Morigito. Good afternoon. Greetings from Sierra Leone. Um, over the past few weeks, just as the previous speaker just said, we have submitted a clean cooking energy compact to the United Nations for Sierra Leone. And key among the highlights, which I am going to outline in the next couple of minutes, include but not limited to the ones that I'm going to highlight now. The first target that we've set ourselves is to increase the use of LPG to an adoption rate of about 25%. And by virtue of that, we've also engaged the ECOWAS Commission for Renewable Energy, ECRI, to see how if they could help us to develop a strategy or policy to achieving that. And the second target there we've also set was that we want to increase energy saving cooking solution for all households, sustainable production of wood fields, conversion of organic municipal and agricultural waste to energy for domestic cooking, sustainable production of wood fields, and we also intend to increase the efficiency of biomass tools to a minimum of about 20%. But having said all of these, these are some of the actions and commitment as we have made as a government. And these are the actions and commitment that we've made so far. First is to set up a bioenergy steering committee. And the second is to increase the proportion of LPG gas and the usage of electricity to an ambitious 25% proportion. And also looking at providing incentives for better cooking and financing for consumers and wood fuel producers. We also intend to support forest management and reducing deforestation, strengthen institutions and enterprises in clean cooking and sustainable wood production. Madam Chair, distinguished guest, we hope with some of these actions that we intend to achieve in the next couple of years as we reach the 2030 target, we believe people in Sierra Leone will cook with clean cooking and a more resilient climate technologies. And by then, we will have recovered most of our lost forests, probably to about 40% um, regeneration, which will also help to strengthen our economy. And in so doing, that will also create new jobs for our local companies and also the manufacturing of sustainable product to local resources will also be enhanced. And then again, that will also increase agricultural productivity and more critically also, you know, to secure the water supply services. So for us as a government, I, on behalf of the entire Ministry of Energy, want to join our colleague ministers who are also participating in this and also the UN body, NGOs, for the launch of this cleaner cooking energy compact and to reaffirm our government's commitment to the execution of this compact. I want to thank you very much for your audience and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. It is really encouraging to hear all that Sierra Leone is committed to doing over the next several years. Next, we will be hearing from Dr. Faith Wandera Andongo, the Senior Deputy, Deputy Director of Renewable Energy, Ministry of Energy from Kenya. Dr. Wandera Andongo, the floor is yours for a brief intervention. Thank you very much, Tony, for that introduction. I am indeed pleased to be part of this uh, launch of uh, the Clean Cooking Compact by the Clean Cooking Alliance. And Kenya would like to congratulate the Clean Cooking Alliance and partners for launching the multi-stakeholder Clean Cooking Compact. And Kenya supports the ambitions contained therein. As a global champion on energy access, Kenya has taken the following actions to prioritize planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of clean cooking projects. We recognized clean cooking as a high impact initiative in the Sustainable Energy for All Action Agenda 2016 and set a target to achieve universal clean cooking by 2028. We have further submitted a national clean cooking compact to the UN High Level Dialogue on Energy. It incorporates, among other commitments, a target to transition all public institutions, boarding schools, hospitals, Tibet institutions, prisons, etc., from the use of biomass cooking fuels to higher tire cooking solutions by 2025. 
We are also implementing the Green Climate Fund clean climate friendly cooking projects 2020-2024 for promoting improved cook stoves to abate 5.3 megatons of CO2 equivalent as a contribution to the national NDC targets and to benefit about 8 million people with access to clean cook stoves. Further, we have uh, sensitized 44 counties on the gender in energy policy and mainstreaming gender into the planned national clean cooking strategy is a priority. We also have a target to reduce the number of household biomass related deaths from 21,560, which is 49% of total deaths, to 8,800, which is 20% of the total deaths by 2028 under the National Climate Change Action Plan, among other clean cooking related objectives. We have further developed a number of strategies, including the bioenergy strategy 2020 to 2027, the energy efficiency and conservation strategy 2020, and the 10 year bioethanol master plan to address sustainable and efficient utilization of biomass fuels and technologies and to hasten the transition to clean cooking. We also have uh, an EU funded project to develop national and county capacity for energy planning under which clean cooking is a top agenda. And uh, through the Clean Cooking Association of Kenya, we have provided a platform for private sector players in the clean cooking sector to actively engage with other stakeholders and to lobby for a favorable enabling environment and market development. And lastly, on uh, implementing projects, we have uh, various projects uh, targeted at reducing CO2 emissions and household air pollution, such as the GCF Climate Friendly Cooking Project, the COSA Project Subcomponent for Clean Cook Stoves, the GIZ Endeavor Project, and household and institutional biogas projects. This list is not exhaustive. However, ongoing interventions on clean cooking in Kenya already relate to at least four of the seven targets in the just launched Clean Cooking Compact. This signals the synergy between the national and global actions on clean cooking. And really Kenya looks forward to partnering with other agencies in the quest to achieve universal clean cooking by 2028. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Wandera Odongo. As always, Kenya is showing your leadership in this space. And I'm especially encouraged to hear about uh, the priority on gender here. It's, it's, it's really encouraging. Our final intervention will be from Doc, uh, Mr. Nasrul Hamid. He is the State Minister for the Ministry of Energy, Energy and Mineral Resources of Bangladesh. Mr. Hamid, what is Bangladesh doing to increase access to clean cooking? So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eldred Tundi Taylor, Deputy Minister, Ministry of Energy, Sierra Leone. Dr. Faith Wandera, Senior Deputy Director of Renewable Energy, Ministry of Energy, Kenya, respected chair, distinguished audience. Let me wish good morning and good evening from Bangladesh to you all. I'm glad to know that Clean Cooking Alliances has come up with a Clean Cooking Energy Compact, which is a well-structured initiative to ensure access to affordable clean cooking solutions uh, by 2030. I'm happy to mention that Bangladesh is already there in pursuing the cause. In 2013, Power Division launched Country Action Plan for Clean Cook Stores to promote clean cooking in Bangladesh. The target was clean cooking for all by 230, by creating an enabling environment. Household energy platform program in Bangladesh, a government project, has been working under Shreda to coordinate and facilitate clean cooking sector activities. Nearly 8 million traditional cook stoves have been replaced so far by improved cook stoves, which is almost one third of the total traditional cook stoves. These cook stoves are of higher thermal efficiency that emit less carbon dioxide and particulate matters. Apart from that, since 2005, LPG companies in Bangladesh have been providing this clean fuel even to the last mile consumers. The LPG sector enjoys many benefits, including waiving import duties. Bangladesh has also been working to promote biogas and electric cooking solutions. Because of the increase in electricity coverage, 
electricity cooking, electric cooking is gaining popularity for its comfortability as well as ability of electricity at affordable price. The success of clean cooking interventions depends mainly on the willingness and ability of the end users to change their habit to clean cooking systems. To meet that, this end, we need a concerted effort from the government, academia, development partners, financial institutions, NGOs, and civil society. We have taken a holistic approach to ensure 100% access to clean cooking, and hopefully we'll be able to achieve our target even before the stipulated timeline. Let's say yes to clean cooking, which is healthy population free and friendly to people, nature and environment. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. Thank you, that was, uh, that was excellent. Thank you all to the country uh, leaders for your interventions today. Um, in addition to the commitments made by lead country governments, donors, implementing organizations, and other ecosystem actors must all come together during this critical period to ensure that we reach the goal of universal access to clean cooking. Today, we are going to hear from several donors and partner organizations about their support of this multi-stakeholder energy compact and what they are doing to accelerate access to clean cooking for all. In the interest of time, I'm going to do, introduce all of the panelists now and ask uh, that you keep your intervention short. So first, we, uh, with us today, we have Ms. Hannah Windmenga of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Netherlands, Dr. Simon Batchelor, the Research and Innovation Coordinator of the Modern Energy uh, Cooking Services, Ms. Sheila Obrocha, the International Coordinator for Energia, Mr. Thomas Fogrub, the Head of the Coordination Unit of the Global Platform of Action on Sustainable Energy in Displacement Settings of UNITAR, Mr. Kuhn Peters, the Executive Director of GOGLA, Ms. Rafaela Belanca, the Energy and Food Security Advisor of the World Food Program, and Ms. Christina Espinosa, the Director of Clean Cooking from the World Central Kitchen. Let's start with you, Ms. Hannah. Yes, thank you, Dani. And first of all, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak here today uh, during this very important event on a topic that really lays at the core also of uh, the Dutch energy and development agenda, clean cooking. Uh, we welcome the Clean Cooking Alliance Energy Compact, an energy compact that is clear and action oriented. We support the multi-stakeholder approach that you have chosen, and that will be of great added value because we cannot really tackle this challenge alone. In fact, no one can. And as some of you might know, uh, together with the governments of Kenya and Malawi, we as Netherlands have also launched uh, a call to action and have presented the clean cooking principles. And we were of course very happy to see them uh, mentioned again in your compact. And this open call really asks uh, all parties to accelerate the much needed action on access to clean cooking for everyone in order to realize SDG 7 by 2030. Because the energy transition can only be effective if it is just and inclusive. And no topic really illustrates this better, I think, than clean cooking. As you all know, we are not on track to provide clean cooking fuels, technologies and services to the 2.6 billion people without access to clean cooking solutions. And that is why clean cooking plays an important role in our NL Energy Compact. In the NL Energy Compact, over 26 Dutch private and public organizations, some of them also participating here today, have joined forces in a typically Dutch way to support access to uh, energy and access to clean cooking. Together, we support a just and inclusive energy transition that is gender sensitive, locally led and globally connected. And you can count on us for continued support on the clean cooking agenda. And we look forward to cooperate on this important topic with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And now over to you, Dr. Simon Batchelor. Thank you. Um, yes, now this is a fantastic initiative of uh, the Clean Cooking Alliance, and we really appreciate that you have brought us all together in this compact. I mean, there are many people we're going to hear from UNITAR, World Food Programme, and uh, FAITH, we cooperate with Kenya. So we really believe in what you're saying, that there is no just energy transition without universal access to clean cooking. 
Uh, we really think that this compact draws attention to the net zero carbon elements of the Clean Cooking Challenge, and we really appreciate it. As I said, we are working closely as researchers with a, the whole breadth of uh, uh, stakeholders that are within the compact, and we do believe that there is a need for a collaborative system-wide approach. Um, we particularly, uh, many of you know, our fixation on electric cooking, and we particularly appreciate the synergy with electrification. We think that cooking has to be uh, embedded in national planning and indeed in the nationally determined contributions. And for that, we greatly appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And Ms. Sheila Obrocha. Thank you very much, uh, Donny, and uh, greetings to all my distinguished panelists and, and everyone listening in. Um, as was rightly said when we start with the introduction uh, to, this, uh, to this event, with the 2030 deadline for achieving universal energy access a little over eight years away, because we are uh, in uh, just October uh, 2021, we need ambitious commitments to reach the least attractive markets and those with the slowest progress to date towards universal clean cooking. Energy is unequivocal that we cannot achieve a just and inclusive transition to universal clean cooking without women being decision makers, co-investors and providers of clean cooking solutions. We are thus proud to be a founding member of the Clean Cooking SDG 7 multi-stakeholder energy compact. In doing our part for the compact, we make the commitment to achieve the following by 2025. Empowering and equipping 8,000 women entrepreneurs with skills, knowledge, and resources to sustainably engage in the supply of energy services, including clean cooking, for households and productive uses to 4 million consumers living in last mile communities. Improving their enabling policy and institutional environment by providing technical assistance to 12 companies and government agencies to develop, implement, and monitor gender responsive, gender transformative uh, clean cooking policies and strategies. We will proactively engage in transformative partnerships that mobilize investments, political commitments, and accelerate concrete actions. These include, amongst others, the Multi-Stakeholder Gender and Energy Compact, the Africa-Europe Energy Partnership, the SDG7 Technical Advisory Group, the Health and Energy Platform for Action, and of course, the coalition driving this Clean Cooking Compact. We will continue to facilitate voices and the presence of empowered women and youth at decision-making tables and in leadership through several initiatives, including by supporting at least 10 women per year to participate in national and international forums, and by supporting higher education on gender and energy through the Energy Climate Fellowship. We will enhance public awareness on gender and clean cooking through national level campaigns reaching 70 million people. We will build robust evidence, knowledge products and truths, tools, and drive pioneering innovations that address gender and clean cooking challenges in developing countries. Very importantly, we will hold ourselves accountable to reducing gender gaps in every aspect of the clean cooking sector and will call for accountability and transparency from our other colleagues on their gender and clean cooking targets and commitments. We congratulate the Clean Cooking Alliance and all other parties for prioritizing this very important uh, compact that we feel is a critical milestone in achieving SDG 7 and SDG 5 on gender and women's empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Next up, we have Mr. Thomas Fograb. Thank you, Donny. <clears throat> good afternoon, good morning, colleagues. Uh, good to see you all. Um, yes, the uh, Clean Cooking Alliance is a long-standing partner for the GPA, for the Global Platform for Action for Sustainable Energy in Displacement Settings. And we are the one-stop shop for everyone who's interested in SDG 7 for displaced people, so for refugees and internally displaced people. And, um, and the CCA is a prime partner and the founder of the GPA three years ago because cooking is the biggest need in our sector. So 80% of the 100 million people we're talking about do not have access or still using firewood and charcoal for, for, for providing the cooking needs. We, um, we know from research that for each person, they collect 1 to 1.2 to 2.4 kilogram per day um, to cook the food. So it is really a very significant uh, challenge we are talking about here. 
On the other hand, the challenges in the displacement settings are very similar to those in development um, settings. And we heard about these today, so I won't go into details. However, there's an additional complexity in the humanitarian space, which is the temporary nature of these displacement settings and the density of these displacement settings. On the other hand, the density also offers maybe uh, new innovative finance solutions because we have a large population on a relatively small um, plot of land. So this is why we are working very hard um, with um, the Clean Cooking Alliance, with many other partners. Also, we heard from, from Max today already um, on this topic. And we do this mainly with three components already. So we do a lot of advocacy and support work. Um, for example, we have a fantastic program running with WFP and uh, with the support of Max, where we um, empower um, local um, partners to develop high quality energy programs with, a, um, with an also a strong private sector component. We offer technical workshops together with the Clean uh, Cooking Lines and other partners um, for experts on the ground. And we're also working on um, blended finance solutions. Um, so um, as, as um, Jeline said at the beginning, a lot has been done already, but still a lot needs to be done. So thank you all for putting this compact together. Thank you, Dymphna and your team for bringing us um, all behind this, this document. And we're looking forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And next up, we have Mr. Kuhn Peters. Yeah, thank you, uh, Donny. I uh, represent uh, GOGLA, the Global Industry Association for Off-Grid uh, Electrification. Um, we battle alongside the Clean Cooking Alliance for universal uh, uh, energy access. Um, as for um, electrification, the clean cooking for, for cooking, but really um, we do it for all the same arguments and the same stories um, of how why we need to have universal energy access for the ethical, um, the economical, uh, the climate arguments, etc. We share the belief that uh, we have all the solutions uh, at our hands and universal energy access is, uh, is really achievable. But we always also share the uh, impatience, uh, even frustration that um, we're not making the pace to achieve the um, fast enough. And the only way to, uh, to speed up is if we uh, uh, join forces and make sure that everybody works together, uh, aligned by a common roadmap and common targets uh, with a very open and constructive cooperation. I'm glad that we've all also had always had that open constructive cooperation between Gogla and the, the Clean Cooking Alliance. I'm glad that the Clean Cooking Alliance uh, endorsed our compact to power a billion lives. And I'm therefore uh, delighted to also speak on behalf of Gogla that we fully endorse the uh, objectives of the compact for the Clean Cooking Alliance. Thank you, Kuhn. Ms. Rafael Balanca. Thank you, Doni. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. WFP is the world's largest humanitarian organization working towards a zero hunger. Food is central to what we do. We deliver food in emergencies. We are the first on the ground to respond to crisis. In 2020, WFP have delivered food assistance to more than 100 million people. We also focus on sustainable development, promoting long-term change. We have, we have worked in schools for 60 years with 100 countries to set up a sustainable national school feed programs, many of which are now in the hands of governments, and we sometimes continue to support in advisory roles. Through this program, we reached in 2020, 15 million school children. All this food needs to be cooked, and our beneficiaries largely do it with the traditional methods. We need to ensure that the food we deliver through food assistance can be clean cooked. We cannot continue to externalize the environmental health and socioeconomic negative impacts of traditional cooking. Improved cooking has been on WFP's agenda since 2003, but we now aspire to scale up, to harmonize interventions across geographies, diffuse best practices going beyond improved to promoting clean and modern technologies and bringing long-term uh, change sustainably. We are trialing institutional and special cookers in uh, schools in Lesotho, solar e-cookers for refugees in Malawi, LPG in camps in Bangladesh. 
we can leverage our extensive field presence, especially in humanitarian settings and schools, to achieve this transformational change. We look forward to joining hands through this compact with countries and organizations that share this vision to achieve our common goal. Thank you. Thank you, Rafaela. And last but not least, we have Christina Espinosa. Hello, good morning, good, good evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, World Central Kitchen is happy to be here to support the Energy Compact. World Central Kitchen, uh, even though we might be well known for our feeding people all over the world, one of our main resilience programming areas is clean cooking, of which we are very dedicated to. Most of our work in the clean cooking resilience area is in institutions where we convert schools that are cooking with biomass to LPG stoves and renovate kitchens as well as trainings. But we also do behavior change programming. So here we're in Guatemala and we're working on a study to figure out how those health benefits can be, be met. Um, in addition, uh, next year we'll be launching uh, Real Cooking with Clean Fuels, and we're definitely here to support and endorse the uh, Energy Compact. Thanks for having me today. Great. Thank you, Christina. Next up, and, and just to, to finish, I want to say we had such great um, leadership and commitment shown today from all of the interventions, and it's just really encouraging to see everybody's uh, commitment to this issue. Uh, before we close this part of our session today, I'd like to hand it over to our Chief Executive Officer, uh, Dimfner Vandalans, for, for the final words on this. Great. Um, thank you, Donnie. And indeed, it's really inspiring to hear all of these commitments. Um, but I think also from my perspective, really inspiring that once we realized how little attention was actually going to be paid to clean cooking in the energy compact, we put out this call to action to our widest ecosystem and to see all of this materialize in four weeks, less than four weeks, has been really, really inspirational and truly amazing. And I think speaks to what is needed in our sector, which is collaboration transparency, and a dedication to really moving this sector forward. And so from my perspective, it's really humbling and a real honor to listen to these commitments and to see how everybody's coming together and, and move this important issue forward. At the same time, I also want to acknowledge that it's not an easy process to go through. And so for countries, for cities, for companies, for any organization who is really interested in joining our energy compact, please, please, please do reach out to us because it may feel overwhelming and a little complicated to navigate the UN system, but we are here to support everybody who wants to join the energy compact because the more partners join and the wider our partnership becomes, the better we are collectively able to move um, the sector forward. And so it's a real honor and um, I'm really delighted to see so many of you here today um, to join the Clean Cooking Energy Compact with us. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you, Dumpna. How well said. We, we need everybody to join with us to really meet this goal. Next up, we have a two part two of today's event. This includes a presentation and discussion on the evolution and next steps of the clean cooking system strategy. With that, I will pass it over to Samiksha Nair. Samiksha is the Chief Strategy Officer at the Clean Cooking Alliance and has led with our consultant Stahlberg the development of the Clean Cooking Systems Strategy. Samiksha, over to you. Thank you so much, Donnie. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, this is the fourth webinar that we've done on the Clean Cooking Systems Strategy, and we're very excited to provide an update. Um, I wanted to start today by also introducing the other speakers who will participate in this part of the program. Once again, my name is Samik Shanayer. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at CCA. Lindsay Barone, a Senior Manager from Dahlberg, will be joining us, along with Oren Ahubim, a partner at Dahlberg, and Divna Vanderlans, the CEO of the Clean Cooking Alliance. Um, and if you don't mind sharing the slides, we can jump into into the discussion. <clears throat> we'll start with an 
overview of the agenda. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so as, as many of you know, um, we started this process in 2020. And so I'll begin with sharing a little bit of what brought us here today. We'll then shift to sharing um, an update and a deeper dive on two of the initiatives that we've spent the last few months building out together with our partners and several stakeholders. This is the Delivery Unit Network and the Results-Based Financing Accelerator. Then Lindsay and I will hand it over to uh, Oren and Dimpna to have a discussion on some of the reflections on the process over the last year, as well as what is exciting them about the next phase of work as we really shift into a focus on implementation. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, and the next slide, thank you so much. Um, for those who are aware, we launched this process in 2020 and we've gone through three phases of work. We're, we're now at the, the final part of phase three. One commonality across all three phases has been the emphasis on stakeholder engagement. And that will continue as we shift towards implementation. Next slide, please. Um, here, I'd like to just spend a little time going over what the system strategy framework is. This framework has really provided a structure for us within the overarching strategy. Um, our last webinar really focused on, on explaining the full structure in detail. We'll just give a bit of an overview today, but if you're interested in learning more, we'd encourage you to go to CCA's website where we have a lot more information as well as a recording of our last webinar. So if you'll look at the top of the slides, at the top we have three overarching principles. These principles really guide decision-making within the strategy. The first is self-determination. The strategy emphasizes the authority that individuals, households, and governments have in making the decisions that will shape their future. Next, we have equitable outcomes. The strategy believes that we need to optimize for outcomes for both people and the planet. All people deserve access to clean, safe, healthy, modern, and affordable clean cooking solutions. And finally, we have systems thinking. We acknowledge that the cross-cutting nature of clean cooking requires action across a network of actors and stakeholders. We need holistic thinking and strategic choices to guide this action. And that's really informed several of the initiatives and how we've really built them out. And you'll hear a lot more about these principles when Lindsay goes into a little bit of a spotlight of the initiatives. Below that, you'll see we outline four pathways. These pathways are inter interconnected, and these are the areas where we need to unlock sustained progress between now and 2030. And finally, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see three enablers. These enablers speak to the collective mindsets, behaviors, and resources that we need to deliver on the strategy. In addition to, to these component parts of the strategy framework, the strategy also prior, prioritized a bias for action. We did this through identifying a set of initiatives. These initiatives really speak to how we're going to achieve universal, active, uh, universal access to clean cooking collectively. And they really define what the starting points are in the immediate term. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Um, but we also understand that in a highly decentralized ecosystem with uh, constrained resources, it's helpful for us to define where we need to focus our collective efforts in a sustainable and concerted way. This is how the strategy has identified priority action that we all must rally around, and we call these our five big bets. While we understand that the priorities of the ecosystem will evolve and shift over time between now and 2030, these are the bets that we think we all need to collectively elevate and action today um, in the immediate term if we're going to be successful. The first big bet is around government action. Governments need to lead on this issue and they can deliver. Governments play a central role in clean cooking transitions at a national level. If we can empower them in this role, we can unlock more efficient and effective action by the private sector. We can enable more resources, public and private capital, and 
we can ensure equitable transitions for all people. Secondly, the second big bet is that we need to drive greater public sector and private sector funding today. The magnitude of funding for clean cooking needs to match the magnitude of the challenge. But unlocking this quantum of funding won't happen overnight. The strategy argues that we need to identify where the needs for capital can meet the opportunities of capital and the supply that exists today. For us, this is results-based financing. We see a tremendous opportunity for RBF, particularly because we see the market of RBF growing as it relates to the climate agenda and specifically carbon credits. Clean cooking projects deliver multi-outcome prospects. They have a charismatic quality that can be capitalized on, and there are several innovations in the space that we can double down on to unlock a quantum of capital that can be meaningful today. Thirdly, we can build just and equitable transitions, and we must do this. This means a few things. First, the strategy seeks to enable the highest tier of solutions as rapidly as possible. But this is going to require a mix of solutions, and this will require us to take uh, transformative big bets. Government and the public sector have a role to play. They must optimize for equitable outcomes. This is going to require subsidies and other tools to ensure both access and affordability. We also acknowledge that the mix of, of solutions needs to include transition fuels. LPG is part of this mix. We argue that rather than finding ways to exclude LPG from the mix, we need to identify what the pathway is to net zero by 2050, where we do employ LPG as a solution. And with this, even though we want to optimize for the highest tier solutions, we understand that this won't be possible in all scenarios. So we have to create the space for incremental solutions where no other solutions are possible. Ultimately, all of these decisions need to be made on a national level. Our fourth big bet is that universal clean cooking access is necessary to achieve both the climate justice agenda and the energy poverty agenda. We have the assets and the opportunities for clean cooking to really thrive and grow within these agendas, but it requires a concerted, a concerted effort from all of us. If we don't prioritize this, then it simply won't be possible and we'll continue on a business as usual trajectory where clean cooking is not getting the attention and the resources that it merits. And finally, but equally importantly, the private sector needs to take on much bigger risks. This means we need to find more ways to reduce the cost of investment. In order for companies to scale, to innovate, to take risks, and to adapt to the needs of their customers, we really need funding that is concessional, that is patient, risk tolerant, and flexible. And we call on funders to really meet that need and take bigger bets on the private sector. And so now what I'd like to do is transition over to, to Lindsay to share how these big bets are showing up in the initiatives that we've been building out with partners. Lindsay? Thank you, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking through two of the initiatives that we've prioritized through this process based on the big bets that Smiksha just spoke to. The first is the delivery unit network. So we know that government leadership is essential to achieving universal access to clean cooking solutions. And we also know that governments often face coordination, financing, and capacity challenges that prevent them from achieving their objectives. We often see that accountability for clean cooking is spread thinly across various ministries or agencies, resulting in a status quo where clean cooking objectives and investments are not prioritized, not monitored, or addressed as effectively or efficiently as they could be. And even where governments have ambition, a lack of staff or competing priorities often contribute to the status quo. So we need to shift this reality. The Clean Cooking Delivery Unit Network is a transformative initiative of the Clean Cooking System Strategy that's designed to establish and support delivery units that are dedicated to clean cooking embedded within national governments. 
So these delivery units could range from a few individuals to a larger team, depending on the specific context or needs of a particular country. And they would be class tasked with very clear mandate to deliver ambitious clean cooking transitions. They would operate in close coordination with other government ministries or agencies. And they would serve as the first stop for private sector or other actors that are addressing clean cooking challenges within that particular country. We know that stable government leadership can actually be the backbone for wider progress for the ecosystem, which is why this is one of the initiatives that we've started with. When governments define targets, they set priorities, they develop roadmaps, they make budget allocations, they take action that can spur equitable access. It brings the clarity and the shared vision that can unlock additional public and private sector funding. It can enable private sector markets to function efficiently and it can help to address the affordability and access gap for the most vulnerable, among other benefits. Certainly, this is something that the ecosystem has tried to enable and support government leadership before, but often not with the sufficient resources to help governments actually prioritize issue or to dedicate staff specifically to this challenge. And so where we see government ambition and interest, the Delivery Units Network is designed to bring the resources at the scale that can help deliver. And this is an area where we feel we really can't continue to provide lean or piecemeal support. It really is worth a sizable investment and taking the action to double down on supporting and enabling governments. Next slide, please. So the Delivery Unit Network is designed as a global initiative. It includes an initial set of 10 countries. Each of these 10 countries will have a delivery unit and these delivery units will collectively make up the Delivery Units Network. The network will be managed by the management team, which will be housed within the Clean Cooking Alliance. The management team is responsible for gathering, developing, and providing the resources and support to delivery units within the network. There are also a large number of organizations that already work closely with governments. So the management team will engage these partners, which include multilateral, bilateral organizations, development banks, climate finance funds, and facilitators clean cooking champions and advocates mm -hmm. to provide the technical expertise, the knowledge, tools, funding, and other products or support directly to the delivery units. The global scope of the delivery unit network speaks to the ambitious nature of this platform. So with 10 countries, we create a network that can share learnings, that can create widespread attention and momentum. We're also seeing a strong potential for regional clusters so several countries within a region that can join the network as a cohort. And over time, the ambition is to scale the network to a larger number of countries. When we first announced the, the delivery unit network publicly, um, we received a lot of, of interest and, and signals that there's a lot of demand and enthusiasm for this network, particularly among governments. Um, and, and so we feel like this is something that can grow and expand over time. Next slide, please. Each delivery unit will have the mandate to adopt national clean cooking plans and to mobilize the financial resources to implement these plans. These can be standalone national clean cooking plans, or they can be embedded in integrated energy plans or climate plans, including implementation plans related to the country's nationally determined contributions. As Samiksha mentioned in the big bets, where possible, we should be looking to find ways to embed clean cooking more centrally in these particular agendas. And this is how we do that at the country level. Every country's national plan may look a little bit different, but each of them will be required to have a path to net zero and must include a roadmap to achieve access for all. In addition to developing and implementing national plans, the delivery unit will also serve as a single point of contact for our private sector, industry groups, for funders, civil society, or other actors that are active in the clean cooking space. And they'll serve to help coordinate and cultivate political will across government offices, regulatory bodies, and ministries. And they'll potentially even implement some clean cooking projects. Each country's delivery unit may sit in a different location. Um, and, and certainly many of them may actually be placed within the Ministry of Energy. The ambition is to place the delivery unit at the highest level where it can have the influence and demonstrate authority. So that could include the level of the minister, 
for even the president, vice president, or prime minister. Again, that might differ country by country. Next slide, please. So we all know there's no one size fits all model um, that every delivery unit might need to look a little bit different because countries have different needs and different ambitions. We've largely identified kind of two broad country archetypes. So the first is countries with demonstrated political will. So for example, that could include clean cooking is a dedicated priority of the first lady's office, a minister, the executive branch, um, but they don't have a current clean cooking national plan. And so those countries will be what we call a mobilization delivery unit. Separately from that are countries that do have a national plan and they need support to actually fund and implement that plan. And so those countries will receive an implementation delivery unit. Mobilization delivery units and implementation delivery units might differ in terms of their mandate. They're gonna have different resourcing needs. They might have different team sizes and different timelines. So for example, a mobilization delivery unit would probably require fewer staff and a timeline of maybe two years, whereas an implementation delivery unit might require a larger team and a timeline closer to five years. Next slide, please. So the delivery unit network and the management team will provide both financial and non-financial support to each individual delivery unit. There's broadly five types of support. The first is that the delivery unit network program includes funding and technical support to create a dedicated clean cooking team. This includes funding for some or all of the delivery unit staff. Secondly, the delivery unit network includes a coordination mechanism that will proactively connect delivery units with the financial and non-financial resources available for implementing their clean cooking plans. This ability to help governments unlock funding is a significant value add of the delivery unit network. In particular, the network team can help access funding from sources like the Green Climate Fund, from mechanisms that are supporting nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, and other large sources of climate finance that really need to be maximized to achieve universal access. In this process, the network will provide the support in the application process and building the evidence base that is often intensive for many countries in applying for this type of funding. And the network team will also help to establish mechanisms to coordinate across government actors, international donors and DFIs, the private sector, local community-based organizations, advocacy groups. The intention is to ensure that any efforts happening nationally by all actors related to clean cooking are at least known and potentially involve the delivery unit. Other activities of the network would include providing funding for special projects that are led by the delivery unit team, managing the peer-to-peer -peer network, which include network gatherings and bilateral exchange opportunities, providing leadership training and a career accelerator program for delivery unit staff. This is particularly important because we recognize the value of actually building intrapreneurs within government and that we need to show that a focus on issues of clean cooking can serve as a successful career path for bureaucrats and politicians, which hopefully can start to bring more talent into the space at the local level. Notably, a part of this leadership training includes elevating these voices on the regional and global platform. You'll recall that one of the important aspects of the overall strategy framework was elevating new voices. And this is a mechanism through which we can do this. So making sure that we're spotlighting country successes and we're ensuring that the international community is inclusive of the voices of local leaders. You can move to the next slide. So this is a, a multi-phase process, um, setting up, capacitating and supporting a country's delivery unit requires many steps and, and a kind of a longer term journey. We're currently actually launching efforts to invite several countries into the delivery unit network um, and engaging in, in bilateral conversations. As I mentioned, when we first announced the delivery unit network publicly, we received quite a bit of um, outreach from governments that were very interested in, in learning more about the network and thinking about if there was a, an opportunity for them to engage more formally. Um, as that 
translates into more formal conversations and each individual delivery unit um, will work closely with governments to actually co-create and define what is the specific mandate, the size and location, the resourcing needs, and the local strategy for that delivery unit. And then at the end of this co-creation phase, a formal MOU is signed and the delivery unit will actually be established. And we hope to share more details in early 2022 on the evolution of these conversations and the design of the network. As I mentioned, we've been receiving a significant amount of outreach from governments and other actors that are interested. And I would encourage um, any of you that are, um, that are on the call that are interested in participating more formally in the delivery networks to reach out to us through the system strategy um, email address. It's strategy at cleancookingalliance.org. We would love to hear from you. Um, and we've been working hard to make sure that everyone that reaches out is engaged in this process in some capacity. Great. I'm now going to move on to the second initiative that we wanted to spotlight, um, which is a more detailed look at an initiative that has been designed to mobilize capital um, through results-based financing. As Sinekshin mentioned, results-based financing, including climate finance and carbon credits, has the potential to bring a quantum leap in capital for clean cooking programs and projects. Um, there's been a lot of buzz around the potential for the application of RBF for clean cooking, in part due to an expanding voluntary carbon credit market, growing momentum for the net zero 2050 agenda, and evolving, evolving donor preferences for innovative financing mechanisms. And furthermore, there are signals that the assets of clean cooking, including the multitude of outcomes that clean cooking interventions can deliver, positions the ecosystem well for more RBF. And so we need to find ways to unlock the full potential of what RBF can be for clean cooking as quickly as possible. There's been a number of RBF efforts that have been launched either directly or adjacent to clean cooking. These include funds that are inclusive of or focused exclusively on clean cooking, large-scale issuances of carbon credits for clean cooking on the voluntary market, and, and results-based verification initiatives. But the lessons learned are only beginning to lower the transaction costs and ensure that there are cost-effective ways to unlock RBF for a broader segment of the clean cooking space than currently has access. So the ambition of the Clean Cooking RBF Accelerator is to unlock this full potential of RBF for the whole of the ecosystem in particular with the focus on driving greater innovation, improved transparency, and elevated credibility among outcome buyers. The ambition is to deliver momentum on behalf of the whole ecosystem, supporting existing RBF structures and helping to catalyze new RBF structures. The accelerator will help to lay the groundwork to scale RBF as it's currently designed, but also intends to push the frontiers of RBF design to better understand if and how we can use results-based financing as a means to better address the affordability gap for the most vulnerable, make RBF more accessible to a diverse array of enterprises, and to catalyze other complementary sources of funding as part of the larger capital stack. Obviously, RBF is only one type of financing that the ecosystem needs, but we believe that laying this groundwork can help to create a positive chain reaction for funding more broadly. Next slide, please. So the RBF Accelerator is not a new RBF fund. Instead, it's designed to help build the infrastructure for RBF on behalf of the entire ecosystem. So specifically, that includes four activities. The first is activities to target RBF to context where it's best suited. In particular, this includes developing an innovation and learning agenda. This agenda defines the most pressing learning needs and the accelerator will use this agenda as a guide to prioritize the types of pilots it supports and the knowledge it creates. We're actually currently developing this agenda through workshops with enterprises, funders, and outcome buyers, RBF implementers, and verification bodies. The goal is to collectively define the innovation and learning mandate for the accelerator and its partners. And the RBF Accelerator will then support pilots that are designed to deliver the learnings against the agenda. Secondly, the Accelerator will also undertake activities to reduce the transaction cost of RBF for clean cooking. 
So supporting clean and high quality verification methodologies, developing cost-effective verification tools, and filling in gaps in pricing methodologies. It's important to note that there are many activities that are underway across these specific areas today. And so we've been in regular conversations with many of the organizations that are actively undertaking this work to ensure that the accelerator is engaging them as partners and building upon and supporting the work that they're already doing. You can move to the next slide. Third, the accelerator will seek to galvanize outcome buyers through engagement in global policy dialogues and providing technical expertise as well as potentially launching a donor working group. And finally, the RBFA will empower diverse enterprises to access RBF, specifically providing technical backstopping and technical assistance. Again, this is another area where we see a lot of activity with partner organizations today that are already undertaking these activities. And again, we've been in conversations with these organizations to think about how they can be involved more closely with the network um, in, in sort of a formal capacity as partners. You can move to the next slide, please. So given what I spoke to around the structure of the RBF Accelerator as an accelerator program for existing and future RBFs, and given that there are a lot of efforts that are already being undertaken within the space, the RBF Accelerator has been designed to be implemented with a network of partners. And this is really critical to how we're thinking about how the accelerator will operate and function. Um, there's a number of different types of partner organizations that could be involved in the RBF Accelerator. Um, most notably, this includes engaging RBF implementers. As I mentioned, that learning at the innovation and learning agenda is a really central product of the RBF Accelerator. It helps to define what are the learning opportunities that we need to collectively prioritize. And the RBF implementers will be engaged to help test the hypotheses of the innovation and learning agenda to capture these learnings and the knowledge that's generated, and then to publicize that through the accelerator for the benefit of all. And the RBF accelerator will provide where necessary some of the support that can help the RBF um, implementers in doing exactly this. As I mentioned, we've been working closely with partners across all these different partner types. We've been engaged in conversations to really build out what these partnership models might look like. Um, again, we would love to hear from you if you have any interest in being formally engaged in the accelerator. Um, you can connect with us through the system strategy email address, and you can find information about these initiatives as well as some of the others that we've been working on um, and haven't spoken to in this specific uh, presentation on the system strategy page of the Clean Cooking Alliance website. I'm now going to hand it over to Oren and Dimpna to share some of their reflections on the strategy development process as well as some of the initiatives that are emerging from the strategy itself. All right, thanks so much, um, Lindsay and Samiksha. It's really exciting to see the, the detail of these um, coming out and being refined uh, and, and improved over time. Um, I know when we launched this effort, we knew that it was gonna be a large scale and an, an ambitious undertaking um, because we really wanted to aspire to drive big transformations uh, within this ecosystem. Um, and in particular, recognizing that this is a space that in the past at least has struggled with uh, fewer resources or a lack of, of sufficient resources and attention uh, that meets the scale of, of this uh, important issue globally. And so um, because of that, we really, uh, and, and Samiksha noted this, tried to have a, a bias for action throughout this work. Um, uh, success for us was really about um, having real initiatives, um, real concrete action come out. This was ne never for us about uh, creating a, a strategy document or a strategy report. Um, we really wanted to stand up new campaigns, new initiatives, new platforms. Um, those would be the real measures of success. And so it's nice to see that these are starting to really come to life um, to really deliver the meaningful public goods that uh, hopefully will benefit the entire ecosystem as a whole uh, over time. So it's, it's great to, to see that coming, coming to life. 
Yeah, absolutely. Or, and if, if it's okay, if I can jump in, first of all, to just say what a journey it's been, right? <laughs> um, it's been really just fascinating for me um, to watch how we collectively and with all of our partners continue to explore and discover what really needs to be done within our ecosystem to move us all forward collectively in a, in a collaborative manner. And so I think the journey itself has been a really good lesson and a really fascinating process as well for, for us and I'm sure for Dahlberg as well. And secondly, to just thank Lindsay and Smiksha, who've just been really inspiring to myself, just as their dedication to this process and this effort has just been tremendous. Um, and I'm sure without their leadership, we wouldn't have such clarity where we are right now. And I think for my personal um, as the, the leader of this the Clean Cooking Alliance and this organization, that's really our only job is to think about clean cooking. The things that really stand out to me is this increased focus on self-determination and the role that national governments play and what we can do as all these different ecosystem partners to make sure that we, we give them everything they need to actually design, implement, and finance clean cooking programs. Because if we don't do it, and I think it's been mentioned throughout the morning, we will not be able to meet our um, SDG 7 goals. And so the, the role that clean cooking plays in meeting that is just increasingly apparent, I think, to us and, and many of our partners in the ecosystem. And so the fact that the strategy focused so much on really establishing this backbone, as Lindsay was saying, within national governments, with these delivery units, with the support of the delivery units network, I think is going to be instrumental in making sure that we are truly starting to move towards universal access to clean cooking by 2030. And so with that, though, comes, at least from my side, a sense of um, realization about if we really want to do this, we can no longer do it at, at sort of a lean kind of intervention. It really has to be significantly funded, well-funded, well-resourced, and well-designed, um, because small pilot projects and small interventions are not going to move this ecosystem forward. And we really, really need to um, increase our funding and, and, and focus on that part to um, establish these delivery units and the delivery units network in a way that countries, once they're engaging with us, really feel that they can truly implement clean cooking programs and not just have it be a project that they're designing. And so what was mentioned already, this sort of the balance between the tension between what our ambitions are as the Clean Cooking Alliance with all of our um, partners in the ecosystem combined with the scarcity of financing and resources that we still see in this sector, which is unacceptable, um, that sort of balance and that that sort of um, tension, I think, is going to be one that at least myself and, and many of our partners are really going to focus on. And the RBFA does have a really big role to play there in unlocking additional financing for the clean cooking sector, um, which is so, so much needed. And something that really inspires me as well is to see how we can tap into that um, area of financing that we, we as an ecosystem previously haven't really done enough of. Um, and then the final one that really inspires me about um, the, the strategy that I wanted to highlight is this increased awareness and the sense of understanding of um, what we mean when we say shifting the narrative and making sure that um, clean cooking is addressed because of its multiple um, aspects and outcomes and all the positive impacts it has on society and really becoming much crisper and clearer in what that narrative is and how we design that and how we provide different parts of the ecosystem and different partners in the ecosystem with the right evidence to move them into action. And so one of the initiatives that we didn't talk about today is this evidence to action hub, which will be closely linked to the delivery units network and closely linked to the RBFA that I think is just instrumental and from my perspective, really inspiring to see how we collectively can mobilize around these really important big bets. Because if we don't, like we are not gonna reach our goals. And that sort of sense of urgency and a sense of just clear understanding of what is needed really has come out of this process that we were on together with Dolberg and many of our partners um, that I think is, is just really, inspiring and, and invigorating for us when we start thinking about um, the next couple of years ahead of us, Oren. Absolutely. And, and, and you mentioned um, resource question and really this issue of, of scarcity in, in particular. Um, and 
understanding the scale of, of the challenge, but also the opportunity for achieving climate goals um, and other goals globally, why do you think it has been so hard to overcome um, this particular issue of scarcity in, in resources and, and funding for this, this uh, sector? Yeah, it's kind of baffling to me, actually. Why? Because it's so clear to me that it needs funding and, and it should be an attractive um, area for funders to really invest in and significantly invest in as well because of its significant contribution to making sure we're reaching SDG 7. And so I think there's different parts of it. Some of it sometimes I feel is because it is it is a woman's issue and it really focuses on women and their role in the household and, and focuses on clean cooking. And for some of the donors and the funders um, out there, it, it feels less tangible as perhaps investing in distributed energy and off-grid solutions and on-grid solutions. And so being able and our ability to really showcase to those funders that this is a worthwhile um, effort to invest in, I think is going to be incredibly important over the next uh, couple of years. And making sure that, that people who may have a lingering perception about whether or not there has been success in this sector, making sure that we showcase to them the tremendous progress that has been made within the sector, both at business model innovation, technology innovation, policy innovation, like there has been so much work done in the last couple of years in the sector that really sets us up for being able to scale and being able to replicate and being able to give these donors and investors really the impact that they're looking for. Um, I think it's on us to really shift that narrative and provide all of these entities with the right um, understanding and incentives to continue to invest and to skill to invest in clean cooking, Oren. Yeah, it's um, it's both an opportunity, but also as as you've noted and others have noted, a, a, a challenge to to move at the scale that's that's really needed um, to achieve those those targets. Um, but I do feel like like it is an exciting in, inflection point of sorts, at least in the journey of of the strategy itself. Um, we spent the last phase really uh, focused on co-designing on on really building out these specific initiatives that Lindsay. Uh, started to to lay out, and also you mentioned the importance of narratives uh, being changed. And, and there's uh, another initiative uh, that is intentionally designed around helping to support building the evidence uh, and and that positive narrative around the successes. Because for all of the challenges ahead, there's there are quite a number of successful um, uh, transitions that have have happened. Uh, a lot of innovation in the space with. Um, uh, really quite meaningful and interesting business models that, that are working. And so it is it is quite exciting. I know we've spent quite a lot of time uh, in this last phase trying to really test and understand what's going to work with uh, initiatives such as the Delivery Units Network or the R RBFA, um, really months of, of testing of, of the concepts with various practitioners, partners, um, government officials. We've spoken with other um, similar initiatives in other spaces to learn from what has worked around delivery units, what has, what has worked around um, new innovative financing mechanisms. And so it's really exciting to see these uh, initiatives really coming together. Um, and, and hopefully it really builds on the work that so many in this sector have already been, have already done or have been working on for, uh, for, for many, many years. So um, I think we're, we're starting to move from this phase of a broader um, uh, system-wide strategy to really building the pillars um, that are going to sustain this this strategy uh, going going forward. Um, but but certainly it requires quite a lot of of other partners in this journey, doesn't it? It sure does. And and um, yeah, even when you're describing where we are right now, it just makes me very excited to listen to it. Although I've been right in it the whole time. Uh, when I'm listening to it, I still I get super excited about sort of the years ahead of us and. I think bringing in those additional partners, Oren, is going to be so critically important. And for example, this morning when we launched the Energy Compact, to have the World Food Program there, which previously wasn't necessarily within our ecosystem, which is fascinating because we're talking about cooking. So we should be talking about food and bring those ecosystems together, right? And so another sort of partner and adjacent ecosystem that I think is really critical to involve is nature-based solutions and, and those focused on really ensuring um, biodiversity and water management, as I think um, one of the ministers earlier this morning was highlighting as well. And so to really be um, 
broad and open in our thinking about what does the ecosystem mean for us um, really has come clearly to light through the, the strategy process that we collectively went on um, with all of our partners. And, and that to me is really inspiring. And now when we're reaching out and connecting with those adjacent ecosystems, it's almost like they're going like, we're, of course we need to work on this collectively and, and we should have been doing this for a while. So it's really exciting. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to where, where we go next with the different initiatives and all of our partnerships. And, and maybe thinking ahead a little bit, we know that, that um, the next uh, uh, set of climate negotiations discussions are, are coming up in just, in just a few weeks here. Um, and you spoke about nature-based solutions. We do know that the, the clean cooking agenda really is, is quite central for climate justice, um, uh, energy ending energy poverty, um, so many so many important touch points to to the broader climate agenda. What what are you um, looking for uh, to come out of of those discussions at, at COP uh, uh, in in November that that will give you maybe a sense of uh, optimism that that the international community is really taking uh, clean cooking uh, or really understanding the 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 role and the importance of clean cooking within this broader climate agenda. Yeah, absolutely, and and we're excited about joining these really important um, this really important moment uh, in a couple of weeks in Glasgow. And I think personally, from from myself, would be be really important to come out of it is that if clean cooking doesn't just show up as there's a panel on clean cooking and it's clean cooking only, but really if it starts to get integrated in other conversations around integrated energy planning or around. Um, biodiversity and, and other parts um, that it doesn't get to be just a standalone issue, but really gets integrated in just societal change and energy transitions and other important um, topics that will be discussed um, when we're at COP. So combined with the fact, obviously, that we would always need to um, seek and, and secure additional funding for um, this topic and the, the whole sector, like those two things would be really instrumental for me when we're going to COP. And we invite everybody who's listening and who's joining us today to let us know if you are going to be at COP. Um, we would obviously always wanted to uh, partner with other um, organizations while we're there and, and meet and really um, will be a big focus for, for the Clean Cooking Alliance in the next couple of weeks to get ready for that. Right. And, and maybe just a, a final reflection or question from from me. I'm curious. Um, uh, you know, this is certainly not a, a new space. Um, uh, many of us, and, and certainly those who have spoken today and are and have joined this discussion, have been focusing on this issue um, for years, if not if not decades. But it does feel that that there is a new sense of urgency or a new sense of of really optimism and opportunity around. Achieving the the climate agenda and and the SDG agendas um, through clean cooking is is do you do you feel that what 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 are you most optimistic about in terms of the momentum that that you're seeing as the leader of CCA working with all these great um, partners um, and 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 are there places where you're still frustrated about the pace of change so what 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 where do you see is most exciting and optimistic and and also what frustrates you um, in this in this role? Yeah, I'm not easily frustrated, I have to say, so I'll keep that one for last. But um, I think what's really exciting to me, Arne, is that from the beginning when I joined this organization, I've really focused on the sense of humility and we are in service of the sector and we're in service of the partners who are working in this sector. And I think that's really coming to fruition. Like. Um, even this morning when we were talking about the Energy Compact, all those partners who are joining had just been a really um, open, transparent, uh, really collaborative, co-created process for the last um, period of time that I think is, is inspiring. And we're now seeing that that actually works, that it's easy to say we're doing this in partnership. It's much harder to do it, as we all know. And I take great inspiration about the fact that there are so many partners joining us on this journey that... I think it's just really, really fascinating and, and wonderful to see, Oren. I think I should have started with the frustration so I could end on a high note, but I um, I mean, I think the, the thing really is around financing and the scale of the funding that's available for this sector. And, and I think we really need to move on from saying like it's a complicated issue to one where like, no, we're putting our money behind this because... Um, half of the world's population is still not able to to cook and and safely and provide for their families. And um, I think that part is is sometimes getting a little old, and we really, really need to galvanize and 
and make sure that they're um, investing in the right um, initiatives and the right efforts and the right interventions to make sure that we're reaching universal access to clean cooking. Great. Well, thank you for that. And it's been uh, an honor to be one of your partners along along the way. Uh, and it's been it's been great to work with you on this. So I think with that, I might turn it back over to our, our MC. Yeah, thank you, Oren. And thank you, Devna. I just want to say that was such a great conversation and so transparent to talk about the system strategy process. Um, having been part of the, the design process, I can say what they talked about is, is so true. It was such a unique process to come through and, and really look at what is needed, what do our partners think are needed, and, and how do we plan for that um, and, and, and respond to that in a really bold way. And I think that this is, is something that has come out very clearly in this. And so really exciting um, to hear that. I also really heard three things come out. It is a critical moment. We have to do something or we will not meet our goal. And, and I think all day today, I've heard that how critical it is. And secondly, it is exciting. We have an opportunity to, to reach a really incredible, um, a, a huge goal that will, uh, has the potential to change the lives of so many people. But I think the third and most important thing I heard was the importance of funding to actually get us there. We have really big ambitions and a, an incredible, excellent plan to get us there, but we need the funding to be able to do it. So I think all of those things really came out clearly today, both in what Samiksha and Lindsay spoke about, um, but also in the conversations that you and Difna had. Now we are going to turn it over to the last part three today of our plenary. This is the final session. It is a, it is a conversation on clean cooking. In August this year, we kicked off this series of conversations as part of CCA's 10 year anniversary celebration. Our first conversation was, was with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and CCA Leadership Council member Wanjiri Matai. This highlighted the significant progress we've made on clean cooking over the past decade, but emphasized the urgent need for increased action and investment to achieve universal access. Last week, we held our second conversation with the World Trade Organization on the International Day of Rural Women to discuss the critical role women play in accelerating progress towards achieving universal access and the importance of engaging the trade community in establishing an inclusive and enabling environment to clean, support the clean cooking sector. And I am honored to hand it over today to Kande Yumkela, who will be moderating our third conversation on clean cooking with a group of formidable women leading the way. Over to you, Kande, sir. Good, after, good morning to so those of you in North America, good afternoon and good evening to the rest of the world. We want to welcome you to this dialogue. Uh, we've been listening in to many of the conversations. Now we put together a panel of uh, leaders in the clean cooking space to talk to us now about some of the how. There was a lot of indication earlier, discussions about what we need to do, why we need to do it, and the sense of urgency that we have. But now we want to talk a little bit more about how and also how we can collaborate across countries, but also across institutions to really bring clean cooking solutions and technologies to the places where they are badly needed now. Generally, um, all around the world, people say this is the defining decade for energy transitions. And as uh, uh, Dimfna and others have laid out at the very beginning and Jilin, we are way behind in terms of meeting the many targets we set on clean cooking solutions, not only on the SDG 7, but even at the country level individual countries, what they were supposed to do, we have not seen much movement. Um, so roughly still about 3 billion people lack uh, modern energy cooking services. And so there's a lot to do. We have a good panel. Our first panelist, Dami Lola, uh, on the Secretary General and Special Representative for the Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. You've been very busy. You hosted the world, literally the whole world, just two weeks ago in the first high-level summit on energy in 40 years. You're just recovering from that. And of course, you're leading the whole world again in, in Glasgow. So I know you're very busy and thank you for giving us time here. 
Um, you did very well two weeks ago to, to try to make sure that when we talk about energy access, we're talking about electrification, access to electrification, and access to clean cooking solutions. Why do you think there has been this dichotomy that people talk more, the, the discussion on access is dominated by electrification, not even electrification for cooking, but just access to electricity. Why is that and what more can we do to make sure that we discuss both at the same level to keep the momentum that you started a few weeks ago? Over to you, Damilo. Um, thank you, Kande. It's always wonderful to have the first head of SE for All on a call with you. And I'm hoping I'm doing a good job implementing some of your great initiatives. You, like you're doing much thing. better than me, Damilo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to start in, I don't think there's enough knowledge universally on just how much harm not having clean cooking actually causes and the harm it causes to women in particular. Obviously, when it comes to women and gender, people look the other way in all sectors. It's unfortunately, including the power sector. And we focus on industry and electrification and think that's the only way to get people out of poverty. But when you do see the stats, which is the great work that's happening with the CCA right now of, you know, spending five hours a day trying to get access to, to, to fuel wood to actually cook, one of the largest causes of deforestation, four million people are dying every year just from the continent we're from, Kande, because of that. It makes you really, really rethink your strategy, not talk about gender-based violence and all these other things that are happening. And when we are faced with a pandemic where you have all these people who just can't stay at home because they will die because they have no access to the basic needs of food, I think it, is, um, it has made everyone pay attention and it's made everyone realize that you can't talk about SDG 7, you can't talk about true energy access if we don't really tackle the issue of clean cooking. So um, again, we work in you know, partnership with the CCA and trying to get the message across, but also showing people the direct links between electrification and clean cooking. There's no point going into a community in my previous job and, and giving them access to solar renewable power, but they're still cooking with fuel wood. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And then, and the approach we are taking at the UN and also at Sustainable Energy for All is how do we have integrated energy solutions? How do we have when people think about SDG 7, by default, they're thinking about access to electricity and also access to clean cooking solutions. We um, completed our first integrated energy plan on my country, Nigeria, where we looked at a model to say, these are the amount of people who need electrification, that's great, but who needs clean cooking as well? because there is a lack of data on that. And what is the best type of cool, clean cooking? Is it LPG? Is it e-cooking? Is it biomass? We get hung up on, um, are we using gas or not, instead of the conversation in the, where are these people and what is the sustain, most sustainable way of getting it to them? And I guess my third point would be on the um, just the economic viability of a lot of these solutions. These are hundreds, maybe millions of jobs for women in the value chain of clean cooking, um, you know, in terms of supply chains and everything that we need. So for me, I, I, you know, I think as we're trying to get out of, you know, one of the worst pandemics, which is still affecting many parts of the developing world at a shocking rate, we also need to think about the business of clean cooking and the opportunities of clean cooking. And when we put that all together, obviously with the policy and the regulatory work that's been going on, but if we just even showcase the projects, because projects determine policy at the end of the day from where we're from, I think people will really see that um, clean cooking is formidable for economic growth and also impact for women. Andy, back to you. I think Kande is frozen, Dimfla, you might yeah. have <laughs> um, so I think Kande, we may have lost you, um, but we will continue on. I'm you sure he'll be... Oh, there he is. You, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, Dimfla, I'll come to you, but I want to press uh, uh, Damilola a little bit more while we wait for Maria and others to join. Uh, Damilola, you mentioned that we, we it's sometimes it's lack of knowledge. And part of that involves presenting the evidence 
to policymakers within a country that here is uh, 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 how many people depend on biomass. Here are the solutions. And you, in, in one of the working groups you organized, you had it on data. What do we need to do to enhance data collection and putting that evidence together? I know you've been pushing that also a little bit. Um, I spoke about it a little bit, but most of it is to do with actually having proper integrated energy planning. In a lot of these countries, most people don't know where the people who don't have access to clean cooking are, both in rural and in urban settings, because it's also seen as a rural problem, but it, we see a lot of the effects also in urban settings. Mm -hmm. I think information about the um, ability to pay and the willingness to pay, there's some really, really cool AI stuff that's happening right now. And in the Nigerian case, it was actually quite shocking. We found that half the people who didn't have access to or who we thought didn't have access to clean cooking actually didn't have the actual access to the delivery points. They could actually pay without being subsidized at all. All this information is really important. And it's important where you're putting in frameworks of businesses around, um, around this and, and the private sector, which we all know is very, very critical, especially the local private sector in, in, in this task of achieving um, universal clean cooking. Uh, Devna, you, thanks to you and many others, um, we've been able to raise the profile on clean cooking. Um, let us assume, we want to, re to remain positive, that uh, our field marshal, Danilo Lola, in COP26 will even make the call bigger for us. All of that is good. But I know you've also said, Devna, that look, the action is at the country level also, mm -hmm. in which case you and your team You've come up with a concept of delivery units. Uh, where do they fit in this in terms of action, in terms of some of the planning, integrated planning that Danilo had mentioned? Why delivery units and why are the controller? Yeah, no, absolutely, Kande. And I, I think it's exactly to the points that Damilo was um, speaking about that all of the um, collective actions that need to be done at a country level to make sure that clean cooking programs are designed. Um, financed and implemented uh, is really dependent um, on having these delivery units at a country level because if they are not um, equipped, if they're not um, staffed in the in the appropriate manner, and if they're not housed at the appropriate um, part within the government, there is just not one entity that really focuses on clean cooking, unfortunately. And we want to change that. We want to have this one unit whose only job it is, just like it's my only job, Kande, to make sure that we reach universal access to clean cooking. And I want these units to really only focus on making sure that there's clean cooking programs, financing, and implementation. And I think those last two parts are really important. We need to move away from planning, important, but then we really need to focus on what can we do collectively through the delivery units network to make sure that these delivery units have access to the appropriate financing to then really implement these programs. And it means making sure that there is integrated energy planning. It means sure making sure that they have access to the right data through the evidence to um, action hub that we're also creating. And so all of those things need to be con concentrated with a group of people who have the power to execute against these ambitions programs. And that part is fascinating and, and inspiring to me. And, and I've seen it work elsewhere. And I'm really keen to make sure that we create something as impactful and powerful for the clean cooking sector. I, I, I was a minister many light years ago, and I know the challenge. Yeah. When you want to do something, you don't have the staff with the technical capacity. So I fully can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, but then the, I, I, I wanted to raise another level, and, and you are very right. We can plan, but those plans also have to be translated to some kind of policy that goes to the cabinet of the government and then the parliament to approve. Parliament, yeah. Uh, we have a case now in Sierra Leone. We have a compact. It's, it's, it's a list of intentions. Now you have to take each of those intentions and really formulate something. Uh, isn't that another area where you need uh, these delivery units to yeah, translate absolutely. intention to real action? Over to you. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's it's one part of the delivery units network that I'm excited about, which is a lot of this we will do through partnerships. And I know there's other organizations who really focus on how do you convince parliamentarians to really start enacting the right policy framework around some of these interventions. And so absolutely, um, where possible, we would work with partners who are really focusing on that part of um, the ecosystem as well, Kande, because as an organization, we can't do everything by ourselves, right? We really need to embrace um, and, and truly live through partnerships to make sure that this um, gets implemented with the boldness and the ambition that we're looking for. I, I can see big opportunities here when where those delivery units begin to network amongst each other. Absolutely. Good experiences from one region to the other, one country to the other. And with that, I wanted to transition. I don't know if Taria is, is with us now. Taria, did you join in? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Aha, you're here. Taria, Damilola mentioned we're cutting down the trees very fast. Uh, in a number of countries, in my country here, if you're looking at Freetown, the capital, you see the trucks coming in with the wood. You see the same in Addis, you see the same in Lagos. So the, the cities are becoming graveyards for the forests. But I still feel that sometimes people don't see that connection well enough. Lack of clean cooking, deforestation, and climate. How do we close that circle? Absolutely. Um, and this is actually exactly one of the issues we're trying to tackle. Um, you know, I run an infrastructure private equity fund um, covering West Africa and based in Lagos. And we recently launched um, the West African ARM Harris Cities and Climate Transition Fund being supported by the Global Innovation Lab. And one of the areas we are trying to connect more dots and sort of make firmer lines is really the role of urbanization in climate um, action, because it's an area where the growth of emissions will likely be more rapid, given how much movement there will be to the, to the urban areas. One of the points we make is that the more we electrify the rural areas, we only will energize ambition, and they will all move to the cities. And what happens is that there is a sense that the, the African cities are wealthy, that they're mid-market, and that the cities don't need help and that poverty is rural. But the reality is that poverty is urban because there's so much pressure on urban areas. I think a lot of the developed markets or the, the, the representatives from the West, when they fly into Lagos or Abidjan, you know, they fly into the nicest parts of town, they stay in the nicest parts of town, and they don't go to 80% of the city, which is effectively a slum. And where thing is being done with firewood, with kerosene, and that a lot of the pollution in cities is driven by cooking, urbanization, congestion. And the reality is that our African cities are actually the point on the spear when it comes to climate action and then climate vulnerability. And so it is a difficult conversation to have because there is such an emphasis on rural poverty, which is part of the challenge, and we do need to solve for rural poverty. But the, the fact is that urbanization is also part of the solution. Um, urban areas present some of the largest contributions of GDP. In West Africa, our urban centers contribute anywhere from 25 to 65% of GDP. That's huge. Um, and so what it means is that a lot of urban projects are commercially viable, um, but you know, the re and excuse me, the reality is that a lot of it is addressing climate. And so what we've been trying to engage with our investors on is how we can support clean cooking in cities. And the point about that Dami makes about integrated energy and the need for hybrid energy solutions to take us to a low carbon future is something we all have to embrace. Because the reality is that electric cooking will have its place other forms of cooking, be it LPG or whatever it is, they all have the role in the different sort of pockets of activity. And I think the challenge is if we say we're only going to have the perfect solution, then we may actually have deforested to too great an extent before that perfect solution is actually affordable and readily sort of available. And so this is one of the struggles is how do you integrate multiple paths to clean and cleaner energy? Um, as a private investor, 
you know, there are sort of obvious ways. I mean, LPG in Nigeria is an easy place to, to finance, but there are risks. You know, could LPG assets become stranded? Um, how do we ensure that the LPG um, uh, spectrum fits into energy transition and NDC commitments, right? Because there's actually a place where clean cooking supports NDC, meeting NDC. So, I'll, you know, we'll give you some interesting data. In terms of Nigeria's emissions, something like 25 to 20 to 30 percent is the FAO um, LU, right? And so deforestation and land use is such a big part of our emissions. We actually need science to study to what extent is a short-term use of LPG important to stop gap, build ability to pay, network-based systems, and but make sure we're in a, on a pathway to electric solutions, right? I mean, th there's a lot of work that needs to be done, yeah. but partnering yeah. with investors is also important for sustainability because when you have private investors, we always want the best, most sustainable solution that's stickiest. And so to the extent that that falls under policy, then we can also be, be guided. And so these are our challenges in that we are struggling to invest in clean cooking because it's um, it's it's nerve it frankly it's nerve wracking. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I like what you said. Let the good not be the victim of the perfect. We'll get to the perfect solution, but in the interim, we need to save lives. We need to save the forests, and and we can learn uh, that uh, better transition if we deal with some of the solutions like LPG that that are available. I'm sure you've also given some insights for. That Milola, when she's making a claim to that 100 billion per year that is going to be pledged in COP26, that some of that has to go into clean cooking. So I transition to you, Damilola. You know, private sector is important. We've just heard from Taria about the importance of that. Um, what more can we do to get private sector interested in investing in the clean cooking supply chain value chain? Uh, maybe Taria will back you up, but Damilola, as you head for, for COP, will you have a message? for the private sector as well. Well, I'm hoping Terrier brings millions, if not hundreds of billions into the sector. I have, have a lot of faith in, in, in what she's capable of doing. Um, I think we also need to not lie to ourselves and know that risk capital is important. You know, first loss capital, grant capital is an important equation, especially if we're going to get to the last mile. And back to what was being said, the, the planning does matter. We've, we're have we lucky to actually have an energy transition plan for Nigeria. I'm hoping it is presented before COP, if not at COP. But it, the, the figures are staggering. First, it shows you can use gas up to 2040 and nothing happens. You can still achieve net zero. So that's important, not just gas for LPG, but for gas for base load to integrate renewables. We which is, which is another conversation for another day. But it also shows that Nigeria alone needs on the regions of $410 billion above business as usual spending. Um, the clean, converse, clean cooking conversation, if we are still having these discussions and we're talking about hundreds of millions, it's so disappointing. And that's why we decided to like really homing on energy compacts and make people responsible for it. I, I don't see why climate funding does not go to clean cooking. I don't see the argument for it. There's risks in all sectors and we need to stop people thinking that Everything investable is large scale with sovereign guarantees, let's be honest, you know, because the knock on effect of saving someone's life needs to actually count for something in the environment, you know, that we're in. And I think that's where grant and risk funding actually plays a role. When we know, let's be honest, private sector is not going to come until ABCD happens. I also think there's a role for the DFIs and the MDVs even strongly, to actually chart a way of what are their actual plans, right? You know, this is an SDG. This is something that they have to actually invest in. But, uh, you know, I don't think we ask enough questions and maybe Diffner is best into this or of the World Bank, of the AFDB, and say, can I have your clean cooking plan? Can I see where you're targeting, what you're targeting, and, and what you're doing? I, I found that invaluable in my previous role in Nigeria. Like, twist the conversation. You say we don't have this, 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 that. Fine, but what are your plans to support me in, in everything that I'm doing? I, I, I honestly, truly believe with everything in my being that projects drive policy. Um, I don't see, I've never seen a situation where you wait for a perfect policy 
And then things start. You really have to show things working. And this is from 10 years ago when people told me solar doesn't even work. Um, so there's a lot of convincing that has to be done. I think this year, the stars are just aligned for clean cooking. I mean, with Diffner's group, with Conde, that everybody with the um, AU, EU coming up, everybody's screaming, but we just need to start screaming louder. And we all have to use all our platforms and have a set of talking points where we're demanding for people and also include the women in these conversations, you know, the women that are suffering from these. So more videos, more things to show people because unfortunately we, we're still dealing with the, a large part of the population who think this issue is an inconvenience, you know, almost like, oh, my phone died. Oh, what a shame. I have to wait to charge it. And it isn't. It, it's killing. And I don't even think that the stats we have are, are, are accurate, really. It's killing a lot more people um, that we, than we think. And it's affecting our planet at a very alarming rate. So, yeah, I think we, we all have to stand up for this. We have to tweet. We have to talk about it. And we have to make it just as sexy as climate is right now um, in our conversations. Um, thank you very much. And one, uh, Taria, we, we need climate finance. What do we need to do to for that resource? Well, let me start first by saying that we need more than 100 billion. And um, the reality was that $100 billion was part of the deal at Paris and uh, 100 billion was not met. And there were quite a lot of flaws with the 100 billion in that a lot of it went to mitigation, very little went to adaptation, and it was very difficult to access. And, you know, we can list off a lot of challenges that uh, we face with climate finance. I think we need to be emphasizing that that is the floor. It was, the, it's um, a number that was committed to in the past, and it is not the number that takes us to um, neutrality and carries Africa along and leaves no one behind and ensures a just transition. So I'm going to be clamoring behind um, um, Dami for more than 100 billion to support the energy transition and or the, the just transition. Um, but a lot of that should be done in partnership with the private sector. Um, and the reality that DFIs have a key role to play with providing concessional capital to try to mobilize private capital, especially um, institutional capital is going to be key. Um, we're, because we're going to be investing new assets, grant funding or um, project development funding is going to be crucial. And so we need DFIs to go to where the risks are greatest and see themselves as catalyzing capital. Um, and we also need um, the ESG and climate frameworks for global institutional capital to be rewarded for financing African climate projects specifically. And so there needs to be a require, like a, a way for us to be able to double click into African climate. Right now, a lot of global allocators allocate to Africa as a pool versus emerging markets, whereas we need to be looking at African energy access, African climate, African climate transition, so we need, there needs to be a lot more granularity with how we mobilize and, and encourage institutional capital to come into Africa. Um, sort of just um, uh, touching on, going back to the point of women and cooking and the crisis that we have. I think part of the reason why um, it's also, there's, there's maybe women get, are so interested in this. You know, I'm a mother and my children in Lagos su suffered from severe asthma that really came from biomass cooking from next door. And the reality is that the levels of respiratory disease that we are struggling with in urban centers in Africa as a result of this problem, it is an acute challenge. And so I think for us to be able to sort of express that it's it's not even a long-term existential issue. It's actually a pollution crisis. And so we need to, if we think about dealing with it as a pollution crisis, then we have to think, what are the short-term solutions to dealing with a pollution crisis? And then it's the medium, long-term solutions to the climate crisis. It, it's a good transition to one of our leaders who can talk knowledgeably about that, My, uh, Dr. Maria Nera, uh, who heads that group in WHO dealing with climate, and the interface of energy and health. Maria, thank you for joining us. It's a nice segue to you. Um, thanks to COVID, people started paying a little bit more attention to the health and energy nexus. But of course, you and I worry about 
energy, lack of clean cooking, and women's health and children's health. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, and apologies for joining you so late. It took me a lot of energy to be able to finish the other meeting and join you, but it was a promise, so here I am, and I'm really very pleased. And my key message, uh, Kande and others, is that um, WHO launched it, and I'm sure you hear about it, or I hope you hear about it, the health argument for climate action. We launched it last week. We are taking that uh, healthy prescription to the COP26. And what we are saying essentially is that uh, if you tackle the causes of climate change and air pollution, because for us, this is almost the same agenda, and I fully agree with the previous speaker, uh, it's all about pollution. You can obtain enormous health, uh, enormous benefits for, for your health. One of those enormous benefits for your health will come from cleaner the air we are breathing. And, uh, to clean the air we are breathing, the household energy will play an enormous role. I don't need to convince you about that. And the cooking at the household level will bring, again, will com contribute enormously to this dialogue. So for us, this is a clear uh, agenda of public health. We are fighting very much to, for people to understand on a very uh, concrete, pragmatic, and clear way the connections. Uh, there are no separate agendas. For us, it's all about uh, public health or lack of public health. And in this case, if you don't uh, have a solid access to clean energy, clean sources of energy, your health will be at risk. This time it was uh, COVID-19, but uh, the, the next one is already here. It's called climate change. And the next one can come from anywhere. So clearly we need to reduce air pollution. And to reduce air pollution, clean cooking will play a critical role. How we accelerate that, how we uh, talk by doing that about gender, about uh, human rights, about uh, accelerating the SDG, is also well connected that I think we have a huge responsibility on telling them the more you do on, on tackling the causes of climate change, the more you will be reducing air pollution. And to reduce air pollution, we count on you to fix all the pieces that are contributing to that and household air pollution is contributing. I was reading very recently something that was saying that uh, household uh, use of energy in Africa can contribute enormously to this, um, facing this um, uh, challenge of uh, uh, which sources of energy. I think in Africa, there will be a, a, an incredible opportunity if we take it right on how we cook, how we heat, how we light our houses and, and the demand needs to be generated there for clean sources of energy to do so. The, the, the more we accelerate, more lives you are saving. And this is the, the argument that I think can contribute to convince our love uh, leaders uh, that we'll be meeting in Glasgow. I'm very frustrated because, you know, it's COP26. So for 26 yeah. years, come on. <laughs> so for me, this has to be COP1 in the sense that it has to be the, the COP1, number one for health. And we are, if we are able to do that, maybe the health community is less patient than the environmental community. And then we will be able to, to put, a, 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 you know, a, an incredible motivation force there and, and, and driving aging or something because basta. I mean, 45 million doctors and nurses and health professionals were signing our healthy prescription for, for COP26. So I hope that now we will start to see more uh, white coats demonstrating and pushing and, and, and advancing this because we need their, their voice as well to to, to thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Dimfna, I have the last word for you as I listen to Maria and I'm thinking how much we've made access to vaccines a human right. Mm -hmm. And Maria has just made the strong case also that lack of clean cooking causing so much health problems. Maybe it's also a right. I mean, you look at the numbers, 4.7 million people died now, but we are saying over 4 million die every year from lack of clean cooking. So last word for you, uh, Dinfna, isn't this the time we make access to clean cooking a human right? Because it's so basic. People should not die when they cook. Over to yeah. you, Dinfna. 
No, absolutely. Nobody should. And it's it's 100% a human right. And the fact that that we are still talking about this issue with, with the lack of um, funding and attention that it's currently still getting, it's it's frustrating. And, and I'm with Maria. I'm like, basta, it's enough. It really is enough already. Like, we really have to start moving forward in a completely different way. And I think more than anything, this conversation just inspires me and continues to inspire me because women who are leading these these big initiatives and bold organizations, like we need to collectively move this issue forward and, and start shying away from like not asking those really blunt questions as Dami Lola was referring to. Like, where is that money? Like, stop talking about it and show me where your plans are. Show me where your money is because it is really unacceptable. And I think previously I would always say, oh, I have a deep sense of urgency. I now have a deep sense of frustration and just like, it's enough. So I'm, I'm Maria, I'm like, Basta is going to be in my new word going forward. It really is enough. And, and it's wonderful to have all of you here and joining us in this conversation, Dami Lola, Terrie and Maria, because it, it really is collective action with women like us that can really move this forward because it should be a, a human right. Dami Lola, they gave you some talking points. Basta, it's enough. This is year one for clean cooking. I, 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 I saw that you want to do a rejoinder. So we say basta, yeah. not basta. Don't to you. Don't Over to you, up, huh? <laughs> Go ahead. I would say clean cooking and electrification, please. But I just wanted to put some statistics. When COVID hit, the Global North found $17 trillion. Okay? That was the disaster because it affected the Global North. We need to demand the same mm -hmm. for the Global South. The money automatically appeared from nowhere at very, very sub 1% interest rates. So please, let's bear that in mind. So yeah. when there is a pandemic and a disaster, we, we do find a way of finding the money. And I hope we can do that for the healthcare systems and clean cooking moving forward. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you, our panelists. Thank you, great leaders. We look forward to seeing you at COP as well, and we'll help join to make this happen. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. See you. Yeah. Seeing you. Okay. Bye. Yeah, what a, a very inspiring, I think, panel and these women that are just really leading the way on this issue. I leave um, today feeling so much more energized and just excited and, and determined to go forward. Before we close today, I just want to remind everybody to register for and tune in to the rest of the events we are hosting this week of Clean Cooking. We have some great events lined up, including the next webinar in our Transitioning to Clean Cooking series with WHO and HEPA, a preview of new insights on the global investment landscape for clean cooking, and a webinar introducing Clean Cooking Explorer, the geospatial data tool that CCA has developed with partners, and last, a virtual matchmaking and networking all week with support of, from Get Invest. So please sign up and join in and thank you for all of the great sessions today.